I'd like to introduce Tracy Jennings from Texas A&M. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, my talk may be a little bit different. I'm probably not going to say manure except for right now. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit about something that comes out of the front end of the animal and see where we can expand on that. Um, give you a purpose what we did, um, what our plans are, what our future plans are, what we kind of learned from this endeavor. And we'll talk just a little bit about the chambers and some of the feedlot facilities that we have also. Um, for most of y'all, if you are unfamiliar with the feedlot industry, um, but typically we'll have calves that come in at 750, 800 pounds. They'll be in the feedlot for about 120 to 180 days, and the finished animal should be about 1,350 pounds right now. That's the average. Or they could come in as a calf-fed steer, where they're coming in basically straight off of weaning. Um, the purpose of what we wanted to look at was we wanted to look at the recommendations for the IPPC that where the methane conversion factor or YM was 3% of gross energy intake. Um, I'm sure most of you or a lot of you have, have looked at this document. It's very long, so I did not attach much of it. And, and then compare that to the adjustment factors that are in Chapter 5 of the USDA Office of um, Chief Economics. So in Chapter 5, it's quantifying greenhouse gas fluxes in agriculture industry, or in agriculture and forestry. What this does, there are uh, recommendations for modifying or improving the YM from the IPPC, IPPC model. Um, what they take into consideration are, are different feedstuffs, where we're feeding the cattle, whether it's a grain, uh, high concentrate diets, what that grain is. Also, some of the management strategies. So, beta agonist, uh, beta agonist would be a feed additive that promotes the beta adrenergic receptors, um, basically can increase gain without increasing feed. It actually will sometimes improve their feed to gain. Uh, ionophores, such as remensin, that will also feed, improve their feed to gain and then implants. And they also take into consideration some of the processing characteristics because as we know, if you cross our country and up into Canada, there's a lot of different grain processing methods that are used. In the Southern Plains, we typically will have a steam flaked corn diet. Um, you get into more of the Midwest, you may have just dry rolled corn and even high moisture corn in the upper Midwest, South Dakota, Minnesota, some of those areas. And even up into Canada, we'll have diets that are composed primarily of straight barley where they may have steam flake barley with barley silage. So what we wanted to do is look at this for the continual refinement of methods to estimate enteric methane, because the more accurate our estimates are, the better that will be for our producers, because there may be a time that they have to justify their enteric methane production numbers to possibly a federal or a state agency. And so what we want to do was primarily test this, um, these recommendations for adjustment. Um, how we got to this, I know that most of you, if you're in this room right now, you know who Dr. Andy Cole is, and this was his brainchild, and he had compiled data from 250 different publications, and had everything from the breed to the diet, gender, production type, every bit of information that you could glean from these published papers. There were 1,200 rows of data, and he said, I bet we can really get some good information out of this. And so that was my, my task, and that's whenever I reminded him that he retired, but that didn't work out for me, I guess. So what I did was sort, 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 
Uh, we isolated these studies to focus primarily on beef cattle, finishing steers. So we removed studies that had greater than 20% forage because in a beef finishing diet, they're going to be typically 80 to 90% concentrate or high grain diet. We excluded some studies that had methane mitigation agents. Um, obviously that would throw off the data. We removed studies that, had, that did not have um, individual data, but if we could calculate some of their methane, um, methane production, we could do that. But we also needed to remove species because we had sheep, camel, we had just about any ruminant that if there was a published paper on it, it was in that database that he constructed. So the next thing was to make sure everything was on equal um, units and then again hand calculate some of the data points that were missing. So after sorting that down we ended up with 36 publications or 75 treatment means and what was most important to us was if methane as a percent of gross energy was available or if there's enough information to collect that. Um, we needed diets again to have less than 20% forage. They were excluded from that because we, there was a tremendous amount of data on um, like grass-based systems with steers or lactating um, dairy cattle. So that was removed. So the IPPC uh, tier two recommendation for cattle and buffalo, so that would be water buffalo, it's not our bison. Um, their recommendation is 3% of gross energy is lost as methane in feedlot cattle. And if you look at most information, you will realize that a steer that's consuming a high, high quality, high concentrate diet is losing less energy to methane um, as our grazing animals would. So the adjustment factors that chapter five recommends, it recommends adjustments for if menensin is added. So menensin again will improve, um, improve the feed to gain. There's an adjustment for fat content, barley or grain type, and again grain processing and ultimately the percent of grain that's in the diet. Now I said that we would remove anything that had greater than 20% forage and we have some that have a 60 and 45% of their diet being grain so that other percentage is typically made up of a byproduct. It could be most likely a, a wet distiller grain or a sweet brand, some type of wet corn gluten feed. So then some more adjustments, or not adjustments, some uh, a baseline recommendations for what is considered a beef finishing animal. Uh, these steers for these adjust adjustment factors, it should be a steer or a heifer that would be considered a medium to large frame. Um, the grain source as a um, standard is going to be the steam flake corn. That's what the adjustment factor uses as the baseline or high moisture corn. Those two values will give you the same number. If you have dry rolled corn or a two different type of grain like a barley, there will be an adjustment. Um, crude protein requirements, the baseline's 13 to 15. 13, 12.5, sorry, to 13.5%. Um, that, that's just considered the base for your typical finishing diet. Steers would receive, steers and heifers would receive menensin, and it's assumed that heifers would receive MGA. So MGA is an additive that will keep heifers from cycling. Um, also, it's assumed that cattle will receive an implant. No beta agonist is fed. Um, and then the baseline contains no supplemental fat. That's assuming that there will be fat that's coming from 
uh, distiller grains, there's a little bit of fat that would be coming from our corn. And the baseline again is assuming 3% from IPCC. I think I misspelled that, it's IPPC. And what they are assuming is a 1,280 pound steer. That's actually below what our national average is. It's about 1,350 pounds right now, and that they'll be fed for 150 days. But that's what chapter five assumes as the baseline. Um, I already said there's no adjustment factors for beta agonist, MGA, drug fed microbials, or even implants. And there can even be some changes because ambient temperature on the amount of uh, gross energy that's lost to methane. But they are not considered an adjustment factor in many of these cases, even though they do have an impact on our methane production. But it's likely due to just the increase in feed efficiency. So since we're across the street from SAS, I had to send a few pictures to some friends over there. We did use SAS, and we used uh, Pearson correlation and regression equation. <coughs> this is a little busy, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to just kind of show how this is, how everything kind of fell together. So, menensin, if there is no menensin, we basically have a 4% increase in our uh, YM. So everything that we're doing is going to increase or decrease the YM that was recommended at 3%. If fat is added, if it's between zero and one and a half percent, that's another 4% increase. So each percent of fat that increases, that's another 4% change that is added onto that. So if you have a 4%, three and a half to four percent, you have 16%. So that would raise your YM. Okay, so barley, I said barley. Um, if you remember, <coughs> steam flake corn would be the baseline. We don't get quite as much energy out of barley. So there's an, an adjustment for barley. Same goes for our different processing characteristics, if it's steam flaked, if it's rolled, and even on our uh, forage content. So the equation for predicting the YM would be the 3.0 IPPC recommendation, and then the adjustment factor for each of the, um, so there's menensin, fat, grain, processing characteristics and even the concentration. And what else we also wanted to look at was our predicted um, methane per day, our predicted grams of methane on kilograms of dry matter, and then our predicted methane per kilocal of dry matter intake. So after sorting through everything, we ended up basically with 75 treatment means and if you can imagine pulling this out of a large database, you're going to have quite a range of information. So we had a range <coughs> anywhere from 150 to 723 kilograms. So there's quite a range there. Dry matter intake, I mean, one of them is our low end, we're a quarter of what our high end is. And then again, we have a huge range in our crude protein. But that's, that's kind of what happens whenever you start dealing with larger databases and you're trying to pull information from them. So initially, our predicted YM was correlated fairly well at 0.31, but we realized that we had one study in there that was providing a much, much greater number of of methane and it was from a facility where all the cattle were in one barn. So we were most likely getting methane from the manure and not just the animal. Several of these studies, or most of these studies, were employing a calorimetry method or a SF6 type recovery method. And this, this particular one had SF6, 
but they also were in one facility, so you're getting methane from the manure. So we removed those four studies, and that improved the correlation quite a bit. So the resulting prediction equation um, worked out moderately well. So what did we learn? Uh, we learned that uh, we had a pretty decent uh, correlation on our grams of methane produced daily. And again, we had a relatively high correlation with our methane as a percent of dry uh, digestible energy. So this is just looking at comparing this equation and the recommendations through chapter five of the OCE uh, document. And it'll turn out differently probably any time you take another sample of uh, data. So what, we're, what we decided was that the model did a moderately well job predicting the methane production. And again, we, what we were doing, we were just simply trying to test the recommendations from that chapter. And what we'll try to do uh, furthermore is keep adding to this database and see how it um, grows and how the estimations help hold up. So we'll continue to grow that. And then we're working on trying to sort some of this data and maybe run that on some finish or some growing cattle that are going to have a higher forage <coughs> diet and possibly look at some of the dairy uh, cattle that were in the trial. Other things uh, that we're looking on, looking at there at AgriLife and the USDA from the animal side, we're looking at some rumination behavior. We have these collars that will measure the time that an animal is in rumination. And um, one last thing, uh, the current trial that we're starting right now uh, is looking at high quality or looking at forage quality in their methane production, trying to mimic a low, a medium, and a high quality forage, which was blue stem hay. But we had to make some adjustments because our hay quality decreased over the winter. Um, so that's some of the stuff we're looking at. Again, we'll keep using the calorimetry chambers and our green feed system to measure that uh, methane production while monitoring their rumination behavior. And I'd like to thank Dr. Cole and everybody at the USDA and all the other collaborators on that day. Okay, we have maybe time for one really quick question. Yes. Do you hope that sometime your model will allow you to you know, yep. layer in your So now do I just hit escape? Is that so yeah I mean that would I think that would be very nice to be yeah, able to do that else, but no. I would say that it's not my model to do that with because we were just trying to I don't know if use disappeared. the adjustment factors that were provided in that document and how it mimicked the cattle but there could be some oh you've some had the magical ways to adjust that what would we do without her? I don't know. Which one's here? Go moderate. I got this. Perfect. Okay. Thank, please join me in thanking Chase.